So, uh, dear John, dear colleagues, it's my pleasure to discuss with you uh, briefly uh, on the factors influencing the need for Arctic Valley intervention, and in the title I receive, it's also Arctic Wall intervention. So, uh, ah, how can I move? Oh, okay, that's good. So here are my disclosures. So I'd like to refer uh, to this document uh, during my talk, and this document was issued by both the ESC and the ACTS. So guidelines are not Bible, but they could help in some instances. Eh? And you see an uh, almost equal uh, split between cardiologists and uh, surgeons, and I should say that we work in a very friendly atmosphere. <laughs> So, uh, patient evaluation is key, and I think that when you are deciding upon uh, aortic valve intervention or aortic wall intervention, you should go stepwise. Clearly, first, we should know if the aortic um, regurgitates severe symptoms, and very importantly, in the elderly patient, if the symptoms are related to the valve disease, then we should look at the extracardiac condition of the patient and know if we are going to do something on a patient who is going to live 10 years, 15 years, with a good life, or if we are going to treat a patient where life expectancy is a couple of months. Then we should reestablish a good balance between risk and benefit of surgery. Because we saw in your art survey and in many other registries, also in the other side of the ocean, that cardiology is extremely afraid about the risk of surgery. We don't want to send to surgery patients because they are at high risk. But we completely forgot that if we don't do anything, patients are going to die. So we have to reestablish uh, the balance between risk and benefit of intervention. Then we have to consider, of course, patient wishes, listen to the patient, discuss with the patient, but don't always do what they ask. And then we have to look at the local resources uh, for the plan intervention, and here definitely we should take into account the expertise in our center, probably develop expert centers, and be willing to send a patient to expert centers. So, uh, as regards the severity of aortic regurg, uh, the guidelines stress that there is no magic number, no magic number, especially in the field of aortic <laughs> regurg, and we have to integrate many findings. We have to integrate anatomy <coughs> and the so-called quantitative measurements. And here with the quantitative measurements, we should not operate on a patient on these non-magic numbers because here the prognostic value of these quantitative measurements has not been proven um, in the same manner as improvement for mitral regurgitation, so integrate before deciding that the valve disease is severe. I won't expand on, on this um, look to the aortic valve and aortic root, but this scheme may look very, very simple, but in practice, when we look at the echo, at least in France, we receive from the referring cardiologists, we have at least one measure, but very seldom measure at different level, and almost never what uh, Jabril uh, showed you, a very careful and very comprehensive description of the uh, valve, the mechanism, and underlying causes, as was described for the mitral, and as is now described by Jabril Stipp. So we have also to use uh, other techniques, and uh, really, if you are hesitating, does the patient have symptoms or not, uh, you can stress exercise the patient, that's very helpful. And um, MRI is very technique if you need to assess regurg because echo doesn't speak, which is very rare. And if you have a problem in assessing LV function, which is extremely rare, and you have to use, of course, additional imaging as soon as you have some degree of dilatation of the ascending root, and never, never cast the patient to assess severity, only for coronary. So the treatment, uh, the treatment here is a scheme we propose for the management of patients with aortic regurgitation. And uh, first, we should uh, know if the aortic regurg is severe, if there is no pathology of the ascending aorta, if the aortic regurg is not severe, please follow the patient, educate the patient, that is to say, go to the dentist, etc., etc. If the aortic regurg is severe, we should ask uh, ourselves, does the patient have symptoms 
related, related to the valve disease. If there are symptoms, well, we should go to surgery. If there are no symptoms, nothing new in these guidelines in comparison with the previous one, we have to look at the LV function. If there is a real impairment of LV function, go to surgery. If not, you can follow the patient. And we end up with this table of recommendation stating clearly surgery is indicated in symptomatic patients. And uh, even if the ejection fraction is very low, as soon as you are sure that the aortic regurg is severe, we should probably go for surgery. If the ejection fraction is a figure of 10 or 15 percent, of course, you may debate, but it's uh, very seldom the case in our practice. Now, um, surgery is indicated in asymptomatic patients with low ejection fraction. It happens, we have to do that. We should not wait for 20% before uh, surgery. Of course, if you are working, doing a bypass uh, or doing something on the ascending valve, you should do it. And uh, there are also cases where surgery should be considered even in asymptomatic patient. That is the case if the ejection fraction is uh, somewhat below and if there is a dilatation of the left ventricle. So here we have to be cautious. We should adapt according to the patient's stature, but all this uh, adaptation to body surface area is valid if you are dealing with very small ladies, but it's not that good if you are dealing with obese patient. So uh, do not undertreat the very small lady, and as regards the obese patient, of course, you should treat them appropriately. A big piece now in our practice is to do what, uh, to know what we should do in patients with significant ascending um, aorta enlargement, whatever the LV function, whatever the degree of air. So the first point, the first question, which is the history of aortic aneurysm. I'd like to point out a couple of points which were already made uh, this morning, but really if you have all the criteria for Marfan syndrome, which is the entity which is really uh, the, the best known, you have a worse outcome than if you do not have the old criteria. So looking at the criteria is something which is important. And if you look at the event in the Marfan population in our group, uh, Dr. Jondo and the team looked at a very vast cohort, almost 2,000 patients with a quite long follow-up, and you see the events so the mean annual risk of death in aortic dissection is something like 0.2, but this risk dramatically dropped in patients where the aortic diameter is below 50 millimeter. And uh, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Tyron David's statement earlier on, we clearly changed the threshold, which were extremely aggressive in the previous document, operate all the Marfan at 45, and according to this paper and others, the threshold went a little bit upward. And you see clearly uh, the, the events, the occurrence of events, Arctic events, is extremely low between this threshold of 50, and the, the risk is almost the same as with very, very small aortic diameter, so the threshold should be probably 50 more than 45. Another point which was made this morning is important of genetic studies. And uh, we also showed, Dr. Data, that the fibrinin 1 mutation is important, and the patient with this mutation will have a relatively poor, worse outcome in terms of aortic dilatation, aortic event, and also mitral events. So it's important to add on a genetic study. What about bicuspid? Here we are also quite aggressive in the recommendations, which were not Bible, of course, but only recommendation from a consensus uh, around the table. But now we have a couple of papers showing that probably we have to be a little more cautious also in bicuspid patients. Here is a study from the Mayo Clinic, 200 patients, very long follow-up. It shows that the mortality is not that different from the general population. It shows that there is a frequent need for aortic valve surgery, but aortic dissection is extremely rough fading and they showed that the predictors of cardiovascular events, but mostly aortic valve surgery, is the age and presence of aortic degeneration at diagnosis. 
They pr prolonged the follow-up, and they were able to publish recently a very long 20, 25 years follow-up, and they showed that there is an increasing incidence of Arctic aneurysm, but Arctic dissection is very, very rare. Even if it is more frequent than in the general population, it's a rare event. And it's good when you have two teams confirming the same thing, and here you have another team which also confirms the fact that Arctic valve surgery is frequently needed in patients with bicuspid, but Arctic dissection is very rare, and this study also confirms that the predictors of Arctic valve surgery, Arctic valve surgery, is the age of the patient, and also the presence of some degree of disease at the level of the Arctic valve. So the things are slightly changed. One of the risk factors for a death and dissection, clearly positive family history is there, and that's something we should look at when speaking with a patient, hypertension, coarctation, progression, and it was already touched, the pregnant, especially in the patient with Marfa. So I, I want to uh, discuss at length the <coughs> surgical options <coughs> in Arctic regurge and Arctic aneurysm. Uh, the um, Arctic valve replacement is something you can do, of course, and which is done by the vast majority of, of uh, surgeons, at least in my country, but there is a risk, thromboembolism, problem of hemorrhage, structural failure, and endocarditis. You all know that very well. And if you sum up the risk of reoperation after aortic valve replacement, it's not zero, of course, and um, if you use a bioprosthesis, it's something like 20% after 10 years, 30% after the, uh, 15 years. And if you sum up, the prosthesis-related mortality over time is not that high, but clearly the morbidity is something which is important over time, after 10, 15 years, which is of concern if you are dealing with a young patient. Um, we heard this morning about, uh, let's say, somewhat unfavorable of our um, combination between aortic valve replacement and surgery on the aortic valve. We have Dr. Tackenberg, you see, who can help us uh, if you want to discuss that, because I'm not an expert. But when pulling data from a large number of patients, you can see that finally, if you are operating the patient on a scheduled basis, the reoperation rate is not that, that bad, and the complications are not that, that high. But of course, if you uh, mix up the emergency surgery and the scheduled surgery, you may end up with a very high operative mortality, which is not good. So uh, we have to diagnose the patient early and to treat the patient early and not to wait for catastrophe to operate on. Arctic valve repair, uh, you heard uh, 200 times that it worked very well with our friend Dr. Schaffers. Uh, of course, the, the results are outstanding after more than 10 years. You have 90% good result, and the results are better, like in Jebrel's hand, uh, if you operate tricuspid than bicuspid, but I could not teach you anything about that. The functional results also are very, very good, and especially when you are performing a reconstruction or even a pulmonary autograph, this is of interest in young patients. So what are the indications uh, from these guidelines as regards the aortic root disease, whatever the severity of AR, uh, we said and we, we moved the threshold that surgery is indicated in patients who have aortic valve disease with a maximal ascending diameter over 50 or equal to 50 in patients with Marfan, and surgery should be considered for patients who have aortic disease with maximal ascending aorta over 45 in Marfan with risk factors, over 50 in bicuspid with risk factors, and over 55 in the other patients. So uh, what are, sorry, what are these uh, risk factors? What are the comments? Of course, guidelines are not Bible, and there is no magic number. So we have to adapt according to our own patient. Of course, lower threshold can be used in patients if you operate on the aortic valve. And this will depend on your, your judgment of the, the aorta you see. And the risk factors for Marfan, the positive familiar history for dissection sudden death, is crucial. 
the combination of uh, CVAR mitral gut, of course, the desired pregnancy is very important, and probably here the threshold should be between 40 and 45. The, if the patient comes to you before the pregnancy, of course, you can discuss, but sometimes and quite often they come uh, when they are pregnant and you are in trouble. So the size progression is a very important uh, issue. And the size progression, um, we, we put some threshold, could be two, could be more, but the point which is very important is, once again, there is no, it's not a single shot with a single examination. If you decide to send to surgery someone on a number, you should probably repeat the measurements, that's very important, using the same imaging technique uh, used at the same level and side-by-side -side comparison with another technique because it's very important to comfort your indication. And for the bicuspid also, there are a couple of risk factors and one which should be added is hypertension and coarctation. The special aspects, of course, if you are dealing with a cavity, a patient you are going to bypass and was moderate AR, the discussion should be individualized according to the progression and according to the feasibility of valve repair. And uh, we, we, all the group was in accordance to say that if you are able to propose repair, you might <coughs> uh, dim the um, threshold for surgery. But of course, this repair, uh, this um, indication is only valid if you are dealing with expert centers in valve sorry to say that, worldwide. So in patients with Marfan syndrome, of course, we have to give some recommendation before and also after surgery, and we have to teach them to avoid some strenuous physical exercise <coughs> and isometric sport. That's something which is not always easy. And we have also to give some genetic counseling for sure, no doubt, in patients with Marfan, and it is encouraged in patients with bicuspid. Uh, this is uh, another story we can debate on, but we strongly encourage uh, to do that. So to conclude from this talk, evaluation should be clinical, plus comprehensive non-invasive <coughs> imaging, looking at the valve ascending aorta, the ventricle. No doubt surgery is indicated in case of severe symptomatic aortic rigor, almost whatever the LV. Surgery is indicated in asymptomatic patients with severe AR and beginning of impairment of LV function. And surgery on the ascending aorta exit guidelines is indicated in cases with enlargement of the ascending aorta according to threshold related to etiology. We know uh, quite a lot about Marfan. We know much about bicuspid and the others. We don't know that much. And VAR repair in the bridge center is a promising technique, but it requires real expertise, further evaluation, and teaching from you to the non-experts in order to develop exactly the same mechanism as for mitral VAR repair. So thanks for your attention.